Today we got some more actual history about Fanny Kelly's captivity with the Sioux Indians back in 1864. In this episode, we'll hear about her captivity and release from the perspective of the Sioux, particularly Sitting Bull and his family. We'll be reading from this book, Sitting Bull, Champion of the Sioux, by Stanley Vestal. This book was published all the way back in 1931. Stanley Vestal was the pen name of Walter S. Campbell. Campbell was born in Oklahoma in 1887, and he played with Cheyenne and Arapahoe boys as a child. He developed an abiding interest in Indian warfare. Around 1928, Campbell traveled north to the Sioux Reservation and met with Sitting Bull's nephews, One Bull and White Bull. Campbell interviewed them as well as Cheyennes, Nez Perces, Assiniboines, Crees, and Blackfeet, and he wrote this book based on those interviews. We'll first read about the Battle of Kildeer Mountain between the Sioux and General Sully's army. We'll then read an account of Sitting Bull's intervention to free Fanny Kelly, including some information about her true Indian husband, who Campbell claims was not the same as Chief Ottawa, who Fanny Kelly wrote about in her book. Campbell is critical of Fanny Kelly's narrative, so you can decide for yourself who to believe. When the Civil War broke out, the fur traders, most of whom were Southern sympathizers, tried to get the Teton Sioux to make war upon the Union. They said that the grandfather at Washington was weak and helpless, and about to be destroyed, and the fact that his promises and threats made at Fort Laramie in 1851, and at Fort Pierre in 1856 had never been fulfilled, lent color to their story. The Western Teton Sioux, however, though they had many grievances, refused to be stampeded into war. All they asked was to be let alone. Nevertheless, there was much jealousy in their hearts against the chiefs arbitrarily appointed by General Whitebeard Harney in 1856, and as these paper chiefs had never received the backing of white troops, they could no longer control their discontented people. For eleven years they had kept the peace and made their pledges good, but now they found themselves in a hopeless minority and could do so no longer. Accordingly, in 1862, when their agent came upriver, they met him at Fort Pierre, and with many expressions of regret formally repudiated their part of the broken treaties, renounced their agreements, and refused to accept the annuities he had brought for them. The agent kept at them, however, and at last Bear Ribs, or Sight of Bear, the head chief named by Harney, gave in and took the payments due to his own small band. Bear Ribs did this under protest, claiming that the action endangered his own life and the lives of all his followers. He was right. Within a few days, some Sans Arc Sioux, who had vowed to have the blood of this traitor to the nation, came to Fort Pierre and shot the chief's saddle mule. When he came out to see what was done, one that limped shot him from the shelter of a teepee. The peace party died with bear ribs. Henceforth, what we may call the National Party, led by Four Horns and Sitting Bull, was dominant among the Teton Sioux. And within 90 days, the sorely tried Eastern Santee Sioux perpetrated the Minnesota Massacre, and thus involved the whole Sioux Nation in hostilities. Sitting Bull, far to the west, had no hand in the troubles at Minnesota. But in June 1863, when General H.H. H. Sibley attacked his hunting party of Western Sioux, who had been driven by the drought to hunt east of the Missouri River, he retaliated by skirmishing with Sibley's wagon train near Apple Creek and ran off a mule under fire. Nevertheless, he did not consider himself at war with the whites. He went westward and continued his hunting peaceably. In midsummer 1864, Sitting Bull's people were camped above the mouth of the Little Missouri River, not far from the hunting ground where they killed the deer, now known as the Killdeer Mountains. Pretty soon, other bands of Sioux joined the camp, until there were hundreds of lodges and nearly every tribe of Tetons was represented. One of the Oglala, a man named Brings Plenty, had a captive white woman with him. It was reported that the soldiers were coming up the Missouri River, thousands of them, and that on the Little Cheyenne, three Cuthead Sioux had killed one of the soldiers who wandered away from the main body. Afterward, the soldiers had caught and killed these young men, and had cut off their heads and stuck them up on poles. It looked as if the soldiers meant to kill all the Sioux. While the Tetons were discussing these things, here came a bunch of Eastern Sioux, Yanktons and Santis, and pitched their lodges near Sitting Bull's camp. 
Sitting Bull's nephew, Bull Standing with Cow, was then a lad of fourteen winters, and had heard that the soldiers were chasing the Santees and Yanktons. He thought these people might be the ones they were after, but was not sure. It was the first time any Yanktons or Santees had come to his uncle's camp, and the boy was timid about going among them because they were perfect strangers. A day or two after these strangers arrived in camp, some young men returned from a hunt and said that the soldiers were coming. The chiefs sent out scouts and the whole camp moved back into the hills. The women pitched the teepees on a flat part way up the mountain, where a big spring came out and made a fine pond of good water. This flat was at the mouth of a canyon, and all around were wooded ravines and breaks. The people hoped they would be safe there. Sitting Bull's own people had no desire for war with the soldiers. They were almost without ammunition, even for the old flintlocks that they had. Sitting Bull considered himself at peace with the white soldiers. He had no quarrel with them. When the scouts came back, the herald announced, Soldiers are coming close, and will be here tomorrow. Next morning, the lad, bull standing with a cow, went out to water and heard the family horses. While the horses were drinking, he heard a disturbance at the camp. So he drove the ponies back to camp, and sure enough, he heard them saying, The soldiers are here now. Four Horns and Sitting Bull caught up their war horses, and the boy, who had never seen a battle, mounted his pony also. Sitting Bull selected a fine sorrel, a fast horse recently purchased from some Canadian Indians whom he had met out hunting. He had paid many robes for this animal, which was very fast. He had his gun and a quiver full of arrows. The boy had only a bow. The three of them rode out with the other Sioux to the top of a hill. The soldiers were coming from the southeast. Then they could see a whole army of soldiers coming, a long line a mile wide of men on foot, bunches of horsemen following them, and behind these a string of wagons or cannon. The Sioux waited as the soldiers came near. A man named Long Dog yelled out, Let me go close to them. If they shoot at me, we will then all shoot at the soldiers. Long Dog had a charm. He was with a ghost and nobody could kill him. He wanted to find out whether the soldiers were coming to fight or not. Long Dog charged toward the line of advancing soldiers, and when he got close, he turned and raced across their front. He gave them a chance to shoot first, and they did. They began the war. They all shot at him, but he was invulnerable, bulletproof, and was not hit. When the other Sioux saw the soldiers shooting at Long Dog, they began to shoot back. Long Dog returned to his own line on the hilltop. After a few minutes, Long Dog prepared to show off his power a second time. Bull standing with Cow was burning up with ambition to qualify as a warrior, and when Long Dog started to repeat his ride along the front of the enemy, the boy followed on his fleet pony. The soldiers all took a shot at the two of them, but neither was hit, and they rode back to their comrades on the hill, unscathed. Sitting Bull was proud of his nephew's bravery. He was glad the boy had taken this chance to show his courage. While the Tetons were displaying their courage on horseback, the Yanktons and Santees took cover in a ravine, naturally following the tactics of the forest warfare to which they had been bred. When soldiers came near, these men would shoot and hit one or two. This ambush was on the left east end of the Sioux line. But as soon as the white men saw what was going on there, some cavalry charged these snipers and killed about 30 of them. Forest tactics were no good in Plains country. These thirty Yanktons and Santees were about all the Indians killed that day, though the military estimate was much larger. General Sully was much criticized for having attacked Indians who had no hand in the Minnesota massacre, but as a matter of fact it so happened that he caused most loss among the very ones he was after. As the troops advanced, the Sioux fell back toward their camp. Shell fire and good rifles were too much for men armed only with bows, lances, clubs, and old muskets. Sitting Bull had never seen troops fight before, and he had never heard such a lot of guns at one time. The cannon, which shot so far and shot twice, was a strange puzzle to the Indians. Yet the Tetons stood up to the troops in a way that made General Sully overestimate their numbers by 50%. On one flank there was a skirmish. Some Sioux swept down on the soldiers and Brackett's cavalry charged to turn them back. The Sioux, following their usual hit-and-run tactics like so many buffalo wolves, sped back again, and the soldiers chased them a long way. 
Another bunch of Sioux, waiting behind a hill, saw them coming, got ready, and when they approached, whipped up their ponies and charged. The cavalry wheeled and retreated at a run, but the Sioux ponies were fast and fresh. The Sioux overtook the troopers and pulled several of them from their saddles. This action nearly ended in disaster for the soldiers. Though unable to face the cannon, the Sioux were first-class fighters in a melee. When the soldiers had gone, the Sioux went back to their hilltop again. Meanwhile, the women in camp were preparing to pull out. In that camp was a man called the Man Who Never Walked, a cripple from birth. His twisted, shrunken limbs had never been any good. He could not go on the warpath like other young men, but his heart was that of a bear, full of strong courage. And now when he saw the soldiers coming right to their camp, and the shells dropping among the teepees, he knew his chance had come. He told them to put him into the basket of a travois, or drag or carry him out to the battlefield. He wished to play the part of a man like other men before he died. The Sioux about Sitting Bull were sitting on their horses on the hilltop, watching the battle, when there came a man from the camp, singing and leading a cream-colored horse with a drag tied to his saddle. In the basket of the drag was the cripple with the heart of a bear. When the man reached the Sioux line, he stopped his song and called out, this man has been a cripple all his life. He has never gone to war. Now he asks to be put into this fight and killed. He prefers to die by a bullet, since he cannot be of any use. The Sioux warriors looked at the shrunken, twisted limbs huddled in the basket, and Sitting Bull spoke up. That is perfectly all right. Let him die in battle if he wants to. Sitting Bull's heart was full that day. He was proud of his nation. Even the helpless were eager to do battle in defense of their people. So they whipped up the cream-colored horse, and the cripple in the basket of the drag sped away, trying to guide the animal with long reins made of lariats. He could use his arms a little, but he had no weapons. Away went the horse, dragging that strange chariot, galloping straight toward the line of soldiers. The Sioux on the hilltop were watching. All at once, down went the horse, shot dead. The man who never walked was thrown from the drag and sat facing the soldiers, singing his death song. That song soon ended, for he could not dodge the bullets. The soldiers killed him. Later, as they advanced and came upon his body, they were astonished to find that this man who had charged them alone so bravely was only a helpless cripple. So died the man who never walked, known also as Bear's Heart because of his dauntless courage. By this time, the soldiers were getting close to the camp, and the Sioux made a determined stand to cover the retreat of their women and children. Sitting Bull and the Tetons had relied upon the advice of Ink Paduta and his Santees in selecting the campground in the hills. For the Tetons had had no experience in fighting soldiers, and Ink Paduta was the hero of a half a dozen battles. Cavalry, it was true, could not get at the camp, but here came all the cavalrymen on foot with rifles. And so the word was passed to the women to save what they could and get out up the canyon. Horses and dogs were being packed up, and some of the tents were down when the batteries opened upon the camp with all their power. Then all was confusion, and the terrified women scuttled away with what they could gather up while the boys herded the horses before them, and old men harangued amid the bursting shells. Children cried, the dogs were under everybody's feet. Mules balked and pack horses took fright at the shell fire or snorted at the drifting smoke of battle behind them. The captive white woman, Fanny Kelly, was hustled along with the others through the parching heat and dust. Anne has left a vivid account of the flight of the women into the hills. Meanwhile, the soldiers charged upon the Sioux around Sitting Bull. The Sioux fell back as they retreated. Jumping Bull's horse was hit. At almost the same instant, Sitting Bull's uncle, Four Horns, called out, I am shot, but managed to stay on his horse. Sitting Bull took his uncle's horse by the bridle and led him out of the field of fire. Then he examined the wound. The ball had hit Four Horns in the ribs behind and was still in his body. Four Horns said he could feel the lead in his body. It hurt him so. Sitting Bull could not locate it and had to let it be. He generally carried some of his father's remedies with him on the warpath, and now he applied first aid to his uncle's wound. Then he bandaged it and gave Four Horns something to drink. Afterward, he and his nephew led Four Horns back to camp. Four Horns was able to ride. It was near the middle of day when the three of them left the fight, and as they went back, they found that the camp had gone. 
Many of the teepees were still standing, still full of everything the Indians owned. Buffalo robes, tanned hides of elk and antelope, tons of dried meat and dried fruits prepared against the coming winter. The travaux were still stacked together in rigid pyramids. The saddles still hung on the racks. Here and there a pony remained, restlessly pacing about the picket to which it was tied, and puppies whined from their miniature teepees. Hundreds of lost dogs skulked about through the deserted village. Indian women and children were likely to fall into panic when the soldiers came. The soldiers were apt to do crazy things, it was said, yet although the women had fled in panic, the men covered their flight in good order, and gave way deliberately contesting every foot of the way from ravines and hilltops, saving all of their wounded. When the troops tried to follow them into the hills, they were soon taught the folly of the attempt, and fell back to the captured village. The Sioux did not have to retreat far. It was only ten miles to the place where Sitting Bull, when he got in about sunset, found his people encamped. Even the women had suffered no harm from the troops. The only casualty from their flight was an old woman killed by a bear, which rushed upon her from some bushes along the trail. That night, the Sioux attacked the troops and killed two soldiers. Next day, while the soldiers were burning the abandoned camp, some of the Tetons tried to make peace, showing a white flag. But Colonel R. N. McLaren, who was in command of the work of destruction, didn't know what it meant, and paid it no heed. Having destroyed everything in the camp, including hundreds of dogs, he set fire to the surrounding forests. After this battle of Kildeer Mountain on July 28, 1864, the Sioux scattered. Ink Paduta took his unpopular gang, which had caused all this trouble, and went off eastward towards Dog's Den, where General Sully tried and failed to catch him. The Hunk Papa went off by themselves, while the Minikanjau and Sans Arcs camped on Thick Timber River, also known as the Little Missouri, not far from the site of the present town of Medora. General Sully returned to Fort Rice via the Yellowstone and the Missouri Rivers. When he arrived at the fort, he learned that Captain J.L. Fisk was piloting a party of 300 emigrants, 100 wagons, across Dakota to the west, and had run into hostile Indians. Fisk was besieged in his fort, Fort Diltz, an improvised structure of sod with walls six feet high having loopholes. This fortification was near White Butte, a few miles east of the Little Missouri River, not far east of the site of the present town of Marmarth, North Dakota. General Sully immediately ordered out a detachment of 600 men to the rescue of the embattled farmers. One day the Sioux were moving camp when word came that the soldiers had come again. About 100 of the warriors rode out to meet them to see whether they wanted to fight or not. When they came in sight of them, they saw that all the whites were on horseback. The whites began to shoot right away. They began the war. Bull standing with Cow and Circling Hawk were in this party. Circling Hawk was on a good, fast horse. Among others, he charged the soldiers. The soldiers turned and retreated, and Circling Hawk knocked one or two out of their saddles. His horse became scared and ran away right through the soldiers. Then he turned back, and the Indians caught up with the troops. The soldiers halted, and one of them turned and came back alone to meet the Sioux. The Indians thought he must be the soldier chief. There was a man named White Buffalo Chief who had no mount. He borrowed a pony, charged on this soldier, and pulled the white man off his horse. Both fell to the ground and wrestled together. Fool Buffalo rode out to take a hand in the fight and tried to shoot the white soldier, but he dared not shoot for fear of killing his friend, White Buffalo Chief. The soldier soon got on top of White Buffalo Chief, and Fool Buffalo was afraid his friend would be killed, so he began to beat the soldier on the back. Then the soldier turned on Fool Buffalo and took his gun away from him, and began to beat the Indian underneath and broke his collarbone with the gun. Shoots the bear, a third Sioux dashed up, but when he saw the soldier get the best of the other two, he turned back to his own lines. The soldier had got the best of three of them, and now he was standing up holding his horse. He was a brave soldier and hard to kill. Now he was victor. Just then Sitting Bull raced forward on his fast sorrel. He rode hanging on the left side of his horse. He was first to reach the soldier and grab the soldier's bridle rein, but the soldier had his pistol and he fired at Sitting Bull and hit him. Then the soldier mounted and returned to his own lines. The moment Sitting Bull was hit, he veered away from his enemy, 
clinging to his mount. As soon as he got back to his own lines, Jumping Bull took care of him and bandaged his wound to stop the bleeding. He had been hit at close range in the left hip and out through the small of his back, a nasty flesh wound. Sitting Bull, however, did not faint or say anything. Jumping Bull and a friend took charge of him and Bull standing with Cal went along. They took him home to camp. He was wounded about noon. The casualties of the Sitting Bull family were heavy that summer. First four horns on Killdeer Mountain, then Sitting Bull's cousin at Rose Buttes, and now Sitting Bull himself. For a while thereafter he rode in a drag, but he was sound and brave and healthy. He was soon up and around. This affair is represented in sketch number 18 of Sitting Bull's picture autobiography. About this time, Four Horns felt better. He said the bullet in his body had dropped into his stomach and troubled him no more. During the time Sitting Bull was getting well from his wound, he had time to observe the Captain White woman, Fanny Kelly. Brings Plenty was using her as his wife, and the frightened woman was doing her best not to incense her fierce captors. Sitting Bull watched her with the other women tending the wounded and enduring the hardships of winter without complaint. Her submissive behavior contrasted markedly with that of the Sioux matrons, who, though white persons have always talked to them as slaves, were quite as independent and proud and touchy as their husbands. Brings Plenty was delighted with his new wife, and dubbed her Real Woman, a title of honor reserved for women of the most unquestioned character. She quickly won the respect and liking of the Sioux, in fact, she was so popular that several men tried to get her away from Brings Plenty. Sitting Bull also observed that this thin, pale woman in the outlandish dress and curious shoes was continually being demanded by delegations of Indians from the agencies, who came bearing gifts, supplied by the frantic Mr. Kelly in the settlements. Whenever this happened, Brings Plenty refused to give her up, and a dangerous crisis followed, when somebody was likely to get hurt. The hunk papa became annoyed at this constant succession of visitors, trying to take away the woman of Brings Plenty. But Sitting Bull saw what must be done. He made up his mind. He said, Why don't you feed her up? Why don't you take better care of her? Traders will be coming. We must take this woman back and make a good showing. One morning, early in December 1864, a large company of Blackfeet Sioux rode into the valley of Grand River and halted opposite Laughing Wood, where the Hunk Papa were in camp. Laughing Wood is not far from the present town of Bullhead, near the mouth of Rock Creek. The leader of these men was Sitting Bull's close friend, the giant crawler, that terrible warrior with a Mongol face and the interminable string of coups. Crawler said that they had come to try to buy the white woman from Brings Plenty. The Blackfeet soon knew that it was a dangerous errand, their coming to demand the woman from the Hunk Papa. Without Sitting Bull's consent, it would be impossible. Sitting Bull said, we will take her back, and he sent for Brings Plenty, who flatly refused to accept the horses they offered him. He pretended that he wanted to trade the woman for food to the traders at Long Lake, because the soldiers had destroyed the food supplies at Kildare Mountain, but he had no mind to give up real woman at any price. He went back to his teepee, took her inside, and sat down opposite the door. He had his knife ready. The Blackfeet Sioux gathered about the teepee of Brings Plenty, and the Hunk Papa were all around them. It was a tense moment, for the Hunk Papa did not like to see these Blackfeet Sioux come into their camp and carry off a person in this high-handed manner. It was a breach of decorum, a violation of intertribal law. The Hunk Papa were always looking for a quarrel or a fight, and it looked as if there would be a big one if the Blackfeet tried to hurt Brings Plenty. But Sitting Bull said, Friends, this woman is out of our path. Her path is different. You can see in her face that she is homesick and unhappy here, so I am going to send her back. To Crawler, Sitting Bull said, Go in and get her, and tell him I said so. Crawler went in. He found a fire burning in the center of the room, and Brings Plenty sat near it on the farther side, and at Crawler's right, Mrs. Kelly sat beside Brings Plenty at his left. Crawler told him firmly that he had come to take the captive, and he would forfeit his life if necessary in her behalf. The day was intensely cold, and he sat down to warm himself by the fire. As he huddled over the fire, rubbing his chilled hands, he said to Brings Plenty, I have come for this woman. My friend, Brings Plenty replied, I have no use for your horses. I will keep the captive. 
Crowler drew himself a bit closer to the fire, still industriously rubbing his hands. My friend, he said, I would advise you to exchange the captive for the horses. Brings Plenty answered, My friend, I have no desire to part with the captive. Crowler, still moving further over the fire, again tendered the horses for the captive, and a third time was refused. He saw that Brings Plenty had drawn his knife from his belt and laid it by his side. Still drawing closer to the fire, Crawler suddenly drew his revolver from his belt, flashed it in Brings Plenty's face, and at the same instant, catching the woman by the shoulder, he threw her around the fire back of himself. Still covering Brings Plenty with the revolver, he quickly backed out of the teepee, where his friends at the door hastily took possession of her and mounted her on one of the ponies. By this time, the camp was astir, and apparently divided about equally between the friends of Brings Plenty and those who desired to let the captive go in exchange for the horses. But Sitting Bull and his strong hearts prevailed over the excited Hunk Papa, and after a time of jockeying and bluffing, carried Real Woman away to their council teepee. There they selected certain men to accompany her as representatives of the Hunk Papa. At this meeting, Sitting Bull said, Care for her well. Choose good men to see that no harm comes to her. We can trade on the same trip. Among those chosen were Big Head, Kill's Enemy, Crawler, Pretend's Eagle, and Wet Hand. Loud Voice Talk, the chief, was one of the group who supported Sitting Bull. Real Woman was well treated by these Hunk Papa and Blackfeet Sioux. She herself says, these Indians prove very kind to me. Though their nation is regarded by the whites as very vindictive and hostile, they showed me nothing but civility and respect. She was housed with Crawler's family, and Mary Crawler adopted the white woman as her sister. The party went on to Little Oak Creek, to the home of Hollowhorn, and Hollowhorn's wife gave Real Woman a complete new outfit of clothing, for the weather was terribly cold, and when the Yanktons came trying to buy her, giving her a fine horse and saddle, the Hunk Papa sent the Yanktons away, and presented Real Woman with four good horses and eight fine robes of their own. On Moreau or Owl River, Sunflower Face awaited her in the lodge of her husband, the Two Kettle Sioux Chief, Long Soldier. They then rode down the west bank of the Missouri to Fort Sully. Mrs. Kelly, not understanding the Sioux tongue very well, and being fearful at all times, sent in a letter to the commandant of the fort by a young Indian named Jumping Bear or Charging Bear, who was later to be known as Chief John Grass. This letter warned the soldiers that the Indians intended to overpower the garrison and take the fort. As a matter of fact, the great number of Indians who followed her along were simply hungry, and went down in the hope of sharing in the feast and the reward which they expected to receive for turning the woman over to the soldiers. Eight Indians rode with the captive to the fort, one leading her horse, but no sooner had they entered than the gates were shut and the other Indians left outside. These, however, went peacefully into camp nearby. After a few days spent in trading, the Indians prepared to go home again. They were a little hurt because their friend, Real Woman, had refused to come out and dine with them when they invited her. Sitting Bull was one of those who had been locked out of the fort. Throughout her misadventure, Mrs. Kelly was always so upset that she took the wrong step whenever an opportunity was offered for escape. She scared Captain Fisk off when he was all ready to rescue her by a letter of warning, and did the same thing again when Sully's troops came to relieve Fisk. And now she had given the men in Fort Sully the wrong idea entirely. Sitting Bull and the Sioux acted in good faith. But Mrs. Kelly laid the blame on her Indian friends, and their effort at peace and goodwill was wasted. Mrs. Kelly afterward wrote or published an account of her sojourn among the Sioux, a highly colored, incoherent story in which geography and the Indian names are terribly mangled. The book is not a success. It is an attempt at romance, and the Sioux were not romantic, but epic. Although the moon is one of the greatest gods, they are not her minions. Long ago they discovered that she pays no heed to human supplications, and so they build no altars to Diana. One cannot help wishing that, if the author was determined to play the romantic heroine, she had had some other name. Her name somehow fails to suggest a romantic girl beloved in his youth by the great John Grass, but it was not the fault of Sitting Bull that Brings Plenty only brought one. He made the best of a bad business and restored her to her people as soon as possible. 
Her narrative had concealed him under some indecipherable spelling of an Indian name, long after a young pretender came up the Missouri River, who claimed to be the son of Sitting Bull and Fanny Kelly. But none of the hunk papa took any stock in his story. Sitting Bull was not interested in real woman. He was compassionate as always when he saw someone unhappy and homesick, and he wished to make peace with the whites. This deed of his is one of those which showed the generous heart of a great chief. It is well remembered among the hunk papa, so well in fact that the winter of 1864 and 65 is known in their calendar as the winter when the white woman was rescued. Somewhat later, a delegation of Oglala chiefs signed an affidavit acknowledging the justness of Mrs. Kelly's claim for reparations from the Sioux. The money was to come from the monies appropriated for the agency Sioux, but when the talk was held, one of the chiefs, placing his finger on the breast of the secretary, said, Pay her out of our money. Do not give the money into any but her own hands. Then the right one will get it. The speaker was a canny old man. He had been watching the officials of the Indian Bureau for some time. It hardly mattered that real woman misinterpreted the motives of the Sioux who rescued her, for on November 29, 1864, things happened which were to make peace between Sitting Bull and the soldiers impossible. On that fatal day, a thousand Colorado soldiers, mostly volunteers, led by a former parson, Colonel J.M. Chivington, attacked the friendly Cheyennes under Black Kettle and White Antelope near Fort Lyon on Sand Creek, and destroyed almost a hundred families, mostly women women and children, with a ferocity, cruelty, and brutality hardly to be matched in modern history. Spring brought the Cheyennes from the south. They carried a war pipe and told the dreadful tale of the massacre to Sitting Bull. They offered the pipe to him. Would he smoke with them? Would he join his old boyhood friends, the ancient allies of his people? Said they, we were told that white men would not kill women and children, but now we have lost all faith in white men. We took pity on them in the past, but we shall never do so again. We plan to strike the whites all along the Platte, and after that the settlements to the west. Are you with us? Sitting Bull took the pipe, put it to his lips, and smoked it. It was lucky for Fanny Kelly that he rescued her before the news of Sand Creek reached the Grand River. Another captive white woman, Mrs. Eubanks, was brought into Fort Laramie and turned over to the troops about the same time. Her escort, two Sioux chiefs, had bought her from her captors at great trouble and expense and brought her a long way, but the officer in command of the post, instead of rewarding these chiefs, ordered them to be hanged in chains. For months afterwards, their blackened bodies swung in the wind beside the trail. Nearly everyone on the frontier wanted to kill Indians in those days, and it was so convenient to kill friendlies. So that's it for this episode. This is episode 17 in my series on Fanny Kelly, and here Walter Campbell claimed that her true Indian husband was Brings Plenty, not Chief Ottawa. Campbell was also critical of her narrative, saying it was a work of romance. He even criticized Fanny Kelly's name, saying it was not a good name for a heroine. Feel free to share any thoughts you have about Mr. Campbell's account of Fanny Kelly's misadventure, as he called it in the comments. Campbell mentioned the Sand Creek Massacre of the Cheyenne in 1864. I'll be doing some episodes on this massacre in the future on this channel. There will also be one more episode on Fanny Kelly. She will tell about what happened to her after she returned from captivity in December of 1864, including more harrowing events that occurred to her and her neighbors in Kansas, and other Indian troubles she experienced. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that you can't find anymore on history channels on TV. Actual history is deemed unworthy of TV, but we keep this unworthy history alive on this channel. Stay tuned to this channel for more actual history about people whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.